And uh, we apologize to our witnesses and the audience, but uh, uh, I think we can um, conclude the hearing now, hopefully, without uh, any further interruption. So our next uh, witness is uh, George uh, uh, Sacalaris, who is uh, from my home state of Massachusetts. Uh, he is the president and the chief executive officer of uh, Framingham-based uh, Amoresco, the largest independent privately held energy services company in the country. Uh, we welcome you, sir. Whenever you're ready, please begin. Thank, thank you. Mr. Chairman and distinguished members of the committee, thank you for providing me this opportunity to testify before you this morning on the role of efficiency policies in climate legislation. I also want to commend you, Mr. Chairman Markey, for your leadership role in energy efficiency and energy independence. No one in Congress has taken an active role on these critical issues than you, Mr. Chairman. As background, I am George Sacalares, founder, president, and chief executive officer of Amaresco, headquartered in Framingham, Massachusetts. Amaresco presently is the largest privately held independent energy services company providing energy savings, what's known in the industry, performance contracting services in North America with over 500 employees in 52 offices located throughout the United States and Canada. Amaresco provides a full array of services for our clients, which include energy conservation and renewables, including landfill gas, biomass, wind, and solar. Mr. Chairman, that's a brief description of Amaresco, and now I will directly address some of the questions uh, posed in front of uh, us today. The opportunity for energy efficiency savings in the United States is enormous. The United States is presently using approximately 47 million barrels of oil equivalent per day, mm -hmm. or 17 billion barrels of oil equivalent per year. Based on our experience, we have found that we, as a, as a nation, can save at least 20% of those, that energy and possibly 30% of our usage. And we say that and, and, and we say that because for the last 30 years that we have been in this business, we have achieved that result for each and every facility that we have implemented an energy savings program, and in many cases, much more than that. If then we assume, and to be conservative, that we can only save 20%, then the total U.S. productivity improvement is equal to over 9 million barrels per day, or the equivalent of three. 0.4 billion barrels per year. Now, if we assume at a cost of $100 per barrel, that uh, this was the price of oil, and it, today somebody can argue it's considerably higher than that, then the resulting annual savings are $340 billion per year. Now, if we assume that we have a simple payback of seven years, then an investment of $2.4 trillion would be required in order to achieve these savings. Then if we take it one step further and assume a 15-year plan for the implementation, it will require $160 billion of investment each year, and that will create over 3.2 million jobs per year to 5 million jobs per year. Now, when we achieve these energy savings, of course, we will reduce greenhouse gas emissions by the corresponding 20%. In other words, for 5.9 billion metric tons of um, CO2 today that we have, a 20% reduction will be 1.2 billion metric tons per year. So therefore, as we move forward in our national energy policies, we believe that it's extremely important that Congress should include energy efficiency as an integral and as the most important aspect of any climate change legislation. And the reason behind it, because it's the most economic and it has the most the immediate impact in our society. The legislation shall further include energy efficiency renewable standards that include quantitative and use savings targets, specific targets for each and every year. This will accelerate the implementation of energy efficiency equipment and the federal government should require all retail sellers, sellers, otherwise electric utilities, gas utilities, oil dealers, etc., to make investments such as 
1.6% per year reduction in their energy use. And I use the 1.6 per year so that by the year 2020, we will have achieved the 20% reduction in energy use and the corresponding 20% reduction in emission credits. In, in addition, emission allowances should be held in trust for the public good. We are opposed to the grandfathering of emissions allowances to firms based on historical emissions. The allowances should be sold through what we call public auctions. Then Congress should describe exactly how the proceeds from these auctions will be distributed. We recommend that at least 50% of, uh, of the proceeds be dedicated to energy efficiency invest investments. If we make this national commitment to energy efficiency, we can accelerate the realization of energy savings by buying down projects, let's say, from 10 years to seven years, and then expand the opportunity and hopefully get from the 20% level to the 30% level. Also, by investing in energy efficiency, the Congress can reduce overall energy costs for individual customers, business, and institutions. These investments will also reduce energy demand and as I pointed out, emissions, and substantially mitigate the overall cap and trade program costs. So you're using the energy efficiency in order to mitigate the cap and trade costs. Uh, and of course, associated with all this, it's, it will reduce substantially the foreign dependence on foreign oil and the trade, foreign tra the trade deficit. It will take it down by 20%. Uh, so, Mr. Chairman, again, thank you for allowing me this opportunity to come before you and the Distinguished Committee, and I will be glad to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Great. Thank you uh, <clears throat> very much. Our next witness is Stephen Klein, who is the Vice President of Corporate and Environmental and Federal Affairs for the PG&E Corporation. Welcome, sir. Thank you, Chairman Markey, Ranking Member Sensenbrenner, and members of the Select Committee. I'm honored to be here on behalf of PG&E Corporation to share our experience and perspective on the role of energy efficiency policies and climate legislation. When we look at the options for addressing climate change, it's clear to us that energy efficiency has to be a frontline response. The potential greenhouse gas reductions from energy efficiency are substantial. The technology is in almost all cases available today, and the investments are highly cost effective, especially relative to supply side options. Um, in addition, customers like it. The highest marks we get from our customers are, are relative to our interactions with them around um, energy efficiency programs and procedures. Um, in fact, aggressively pursuing energy efficiency could increase overall economic productivity. I'm not going to uh, go into details on the McKinsey study, which others have mentioned and are uh, in my written testimony, but move to uh, a few comments on the strategic levers that we found in California, which may be uh, uh, hopefully helpful. One is that using financial and regulatory mechanisms to align energy efficiency with the utility business interests is, is critical. This includes eliminating the traditional link between earn, earnings and energy sales, and it removes the disincentive to promote energy efficiency. By also establishing multi-year program periods with aggressive goals, combined with financial incentives for achieving energy efficiency savings, regulators can drive utilities to aggressively pursue savings in partnership with their customers. Another important strategic lever is establishing building codes and appliance standards. These provide the foundation for all other energy efficiency efforts and serve as a catalyst for new technologies, programs, and practices. Another strategy is providing incentives and in reforming tax policies to facilitate deployment of new highly efficient smart technologies and distributed generation. The utility industry is poised to make approximately $900 billion in transmission and distribution infrastructure investments over the next 20 years. We should look to ensure that these investments are channeled to help build the grid of the future, one that is itself efficient and also that facilitates utility customers being more efficient. Comprehensive climate change legislation can also use allowance allocation and auction revenues to advance energy efficiency and dismantle market and regulatory barriers. For example, the Lieberman-Warner bill uses allowances and auction revenues in this manner. The bill includes numerous incentives for states, utilities, manufacturers, and consumers 
to aggressively pursue energy efficiency. Examples include targeting of auction revenues to buy down costs of new efficient end use technologies and providing allowances to serve load serving entities for the amount of electricity their customers save. The bottom line is that energy efficiency is the deepest untapped reservoir of cost savings, avoided air emissions and greenhouse gas reductions available in our nation today. Any prudent climate strategy must look to fully harvest this resource as quickly as possible. Thank you again for the opportunity to be here today. Thank you, Mr. Klein, uh, very much. And our final witness is Mr. Richard uh, Cowart, uh, who is the Director of, Regula of the Regulatory Assistance uh, Project, which is a nonprofit organization that provides research, analysis, educational assistance to public officials on public on electric utility regulation. We welcome you. Mr. Cowart, uh, please th go ahead. Uh, th thank you. Mr. Chairman Markey, I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today about the critical role that end-use energy efficiency can play to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, contain the cost of climate legislation, um, and protect the, the environment. The most important message I can deliver today is that, the national, that national climate legislation absolutely must be designed to call forth to the greatest degree possible low-cost end-use efficiency investments. Uh, a message you've heard now from, I think, all of us today. The good news is that this actually can be done. The challenging news is that most climate legislation, including most cap-and-trade legislation, is badly designed to deliver efficiency. The, we have seen great attention to delivering price signals and on supply-side investments, but much less attention to cost containment through efficiency. So one of the key questions facing Congress is going to be, how can cap-and-trade systems be designed to accelerate investments in energy efficiency? My written testimony addresses four points, which I will touch on here. First, echoing the comments of the other panelists, energy efficiency is the low-cost equivalent of the carbon scrubber for the electric power sector and the most important resource we need to look to as the bridge fuel to a low carbon power sector in coming decades. Secondly, the cap and trade architecture used in the acid rain program and copied in other systems like the European carbon trading system is frankly not optimal for carbon management. It focuses on smokestacks and by awarding carbon allowances to emitters on the basis of historic pollution, they cost consumers more than they should and they miss crucial opportunities to enhance end use efficiency. I've, I work with air regulators quite a lot and I often ask them, what did the acid rain program do to advance energy efficiency? And most of the time um, they just sort of look at me quizzically and, and then they say, well, it didn't do anything for energy efficiency. Cap and trade wasn't designed to deliver energy efficiency in customer locations. It was designed to change behavior at power plants. But energy efficiency happens at customer locations. So if we're going to use cap and trade for carbon, we are going to have to change the architecture of cap and trade to do a much better job for efficiency. My third point is about prices, surely a timely topic in today's economy. And as the others have said, efficiency is the best cost containment strategy we can think of as part of cap and trade. Now, adding a carbon price signal to the price of electricity is directionally correct. But trying to reduce emissions through price alone is going to be much more costly and it will actually save less carbon than a cap and trade program that builds efficiency into its architecture and relies less on price pressure. This is a point that is often overlooked by regulatory economists, but I can tell you, Mr. Chairman, that it has not been overlooked by the governors and legislators in the 10 REGI states that actually studied the issue and tried to design a cap and trade program. People are often surprised to learn how hard it is to reduce power sector carbon through price signals, whether delivered through carbon taxes or through auction. At the consumer level, demand, as we know, is highly inelastic and higher power prices alone are not going to reduce demand enough to meet our carbon goals. We have the same problem for different reasons at the generator level. 
It requires a very high carbon price to make a meaningful change in greenhouse gas emissions through the redispatch of the existing U.S. generation fleet. This is true in coal regions and in gas regions. An EPRI study of the upper Midwest found that carbon prices that would be high enough to double the wholesale price of power would lower emissions by only 4 percent. Studies in California right now are finding that even at $90 a ton, carbon prices cost very little change in California's dispatch. Fortunately, there's a way out of this high cost uh, approach. A crucial design, a crucial fact, is that the same dollar cost in rates, efficiency programs will save five to seven times more carbon than would result from carbon taxes or credit markets alone. We need to integrate that kind of thinking into the design of cap and trade programs. How can we do this? Two suggestions. The experience of the Reggie states provides a great lesson for us. After studying this issue extensively, the Reggie states realized that the best results for consumers and the environment would be to auction allowances and invest the money in energy efficiency. Congress, if you could summarize, please. I have one sentence. Congress has the opportunity to build on this experience through a national performance-based efficiency allocation in which a significant fraction of national allowances would be awarded to states or entities appointed by states on the basis of their performance over time in reducing emissions from their own historic baselines. Thank you very much. Thank you. I, and again, I apologize to you. Uh, while you were testifying, um, three more votes were called out on the House floor. Um, and, uh, and, and while we were out there on the floor for those last series of votes, uh, Senator Obama came out onto the House floor, which um, <coughs> created yet another um, uh, little bit of a delay <laughs> in the um, operation of the House floor. So I, again, I apologize to you. Uh, I have time for one question right now, and then we will have to recess and uh, come back again, although uh, maybe that is a, 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 uh, not a – logistically, this is going to be a very difficult uh, day, that's all I can tell you. Um, uh, let me ask – well, I'll tell you what I have to do. I think it's better right now. We'll just – we'll take another recess. And we will um, we'll reconvene as soon as these week, uh, as soon as these roll calls have been voted on.
Well, um, the hearing is uh, reconvened, and uh, again, I apologize to our witnesses, and hopefully we will get a little bit of a break right now. Um, let me ask all of our witnesses, if, if Congress were mm -hmm. to uh, use emission allowances or auction revenues under a cap auction and trade program to promote efficiency measures, would it be better to channel allowances or funds through the states or directly to the utilities? Uh, Mr. Uh, Sakalaris. Uh, as I indicated in my testimony, I thought that it might be best for the federal government to set up a program and administer the uh, 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 distribution of those funds. But if I were to choose, though, between the states or the utilities, I would probably go with the state route. With the states. Mr. Uh, Howard? At, as I said in my statement, I think there should be a a, uh, a large performance-based allocation to states, and the method of distribution has to be carefully uh, managed, frankly, because we really don't, we really do want to see the funds spent on investments in energy efficiency. So states or utilities? I'm saying states or load-serving entities or other consumer trustees appointed by states. Okay. Mr. Klein. I'd say load-serving entities under the direction and supervision of, of state bodies. Okay. Uh, yeah, um, I would say either the um, state or the utilities, load-serving entities under the supervision of the state. Uh, yes, I would suggest that the funding be provided directly to the states um, to ensure proper oversight and they could use their discretion to appropriate portions of the funding to the utilities. What is the risk that allowances or funds sent to the states for efficiency measures would get tied up in the state appropriations uh, process? Um, Mr. Howard. I, I think there's a great risk. I say this as a former state official. and. That's the reason why I think crafting this carefully is important, number one. Number two, I believe the allocation should be performance-based so that the states are confronted constantly with uh, the reality that if they siphon the money off for other purposes, then next year's allocation is going to be affected. Uh, Mr. Sakalaris. I like that idea. If it's performance-based, then they have an incentive to make sure that the money goes directly to the energy efficiency projects. And, and, uh, and in that way, the appropriations process in the state legislature can't control it? That's why, uh, that's why the federal government somehow has to be involved in order to make sure that they do not get involved, yes. I see. Mr. Klein. I, I think I would favor the public service commissions or public utilities commissions uh, simply because I think they're they're one step removed from the, the budget discussions that occur at state levels. Okay. Ms. Uh, uh, Grunick. Well, we certainly would be happy <laughs> to, to, to accept the money. I would say I would require um, at least two prerequisites for the state, whoever it is, or the utilities within the state to get the money. The first is that the state itself on some level, and it could be decided who it is, um, whether it's Public Service Commission or the State Energy Office or the governor, but that there is an actual plan that the state has on not just for spending the money that year, but a longer term strategic plan on where they're moving with energy efficiency. And then the second requirement that I would have is that um, there is some um, program with some confidence for measuring and verifying that you're actually getting the savings in energy efficiency. Um, I'm a state, we'd love to get money, but if we're really going to get energy efficiency, we want it to be successful, and I think those two are required. And Mr. Dakotas. I would agree with both of those conditions and add further that I think that the risk of um, misappropriating the funds uh, is less now than it might have been in the past. And I think that's because the uh, groundswell of support for efficiency and for investments in clean energy technology is at a precipice that it's never been at before, and I think the public would just not allow it. Uh, that's, that, that is absolutely not accurate. Uh, the, 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 you know, the, all the tobacco awards that went to the states, they just, the states just use it as a big piggy bank. 
and they essentially wind up not actually spending the money on prevention, which it's supposed to, uh, targeting children so they don't get into it. Now, who doesn't want to stop children from smoking? Everybody. The public would demand it, except all this money gets looted <laughs> from the money so it gets drained down to just be a shadow of what it is. And that would be one of the concerns, obviously, analogously here with energy efficiency and renewables, et cetera. No? You, you have to be realistic in terms of the safeguards you, you put into place. And, um, and I would say that in both instances, it is kind of dealing with prevention. You know, it is something that there is no trophy on the wall. It is stuff that never happens because you were smart. You know, kid doesn't smoke and then she is not consumed. You know, you can't hide to build a big groundswell around that, as you can tell from the size of the audience at this hearing. Okay? So uh, <coughs> if this was on the future of nuclear power, which is only going to be one one thousandth the role of this, the room would be packed and people would be hanging from the chandeliers. So politically, realistically, you know, we just have to uh, deal with that. Um, let me now turn and recognize the uh, gentleman from California, Mr. McNerney, for a round of questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First of all, I, I want to uh, say prior to what I qu ask questions on, uh, since I missed the testimony, I hope I don't ask questions that have already been answered. And if I do, please show a little patience. Um, my underlying question here is how quickly can we scale back fossil fuel consumption and CO2 emissions with efficiency measures? Uh, one, of the, one of the ways to measure that would be if we could offset the rising cost of energy by implementing efficiency standards or in, in implementing efficiency measures in our state. Um, and uh, I would like to know if anyone thinks that that is possible, starting with um, Ms. Grunich from my home state of California. It is possible. Um, the great thing about energy efficiency is we have the technologies, we have the knowledge. This is not an R&D program that we are going to get the results five, ten years from now. I just returned from a um, trip to China last month on energy efficiency. And China is very interested in energy efficiency and they are ramping up very quickly at the provincial level to do it. It is a matter of thinking it through, making sure that you have got, you know, it set up in a way that you are you're delivering it. But energy efficiency, once I believe there is the, the policy, the leadership and the funding, um, you can get programs ramped up very quickly. Anyone else, else care to take a stab, Mr. Sellikers? Uh, go ahead. Uh, based on the experience that we have, I think you can do about one on the low end uh, side to 2 percent of the annual consumption. Right now, I would say in the United States, we are probably reducing the demand by maybe quarter to a half a percentage point. So if we get a little bit serious about this and uh, get the federal and the state governments behind it with some kind of the uh, taking some of the money back into the consumer, I think we can get up to 1 to 2 percent of the annual consumption. That is why in my testimony I said that if we establish a target of 1.6 percent per year, per year, by year 2020, we will be a 20 percent reduction of the energy consumed in the United States. And that is the, the, the entire spectrum of energy consumption. Correct. Correct. And, and, and there will be some cases, for example, if you take uh, some of the housing uh, infrastructure, et cetera, that you will save as much as 30 percent. But in some other sectors, you will save only 10 percent. But in the aggregate, based on the experience we have, you can achieve 1 to 2 percent annual reduction of the energy consumption. So where, where do you see the, the sort of low-hanging fruit? Is that uh, with utility production of energy or, or automobiles? Where do you see the easiest? I, I, I think it is the end users. It starts with the re it, people will be surprised. The res residential sector has tremendous, tremendous potential for energy savings. Where you can reduce the consumption by 30 to 40 percent. But that's going to require subsidies or some not sort of government uh, intervention, isn't it? Not that many. No, you probably you take the you you buy buy back the projects from a seven-year project down to a five-year uh, payback, simple payback projects. Then the industrial sector tremendous potential for energy saving right. as much as 30 percent. And then uh, you have the commercial, the industrial, the institutional sector, the federal government, for example. Tremendous potential. In the, each and every facility we go, we save 30 to 40 percent. 
if I take one minute, uh, we were in Elmendorf Air Force Base. We invested a $50 million project and we did a complete energy savings retrofit. We estimated we'll save them 30%. The project is up and running for the last three years and we saved them over 40% of the energy savings. So tremendous potential on the institutional sector for energy savings. So it's, uh, it, it, can, it can happen. Well, one of the things that, I, that I've been hearing and I, I understand to be true is that the buildings uh, <coughs> produce more than 50% of our nation's greenhouse gases. Where is the majority of that energy coming from? Is that uh, to heat and uh, HVAC or is that the building materials or, or where does that energy go? A, a substantial amount is on the heating, ventilating and air conditioning. But uh, even though as simple as the lighting retrofits. If you right. took just the light and retrofit alone in the United States and you go from the incandescent to fluorescence, they say it's as much as 10 to uh, 15 billion dollars investment a year and that's less than a simply one year payback. So just that conservation measure alone. It, so that, that's going to take it, substan I mean you know, realistically, to get billing owners, including homeowners, to get invested in this, they're going to have to have some incentive. That is, that is correct, and that's why we say some of this money goes back into the states or whichever uh, administrative body uh, has control and simply buy back the, uh, the paybacks. Yes, Mr. Klein. Congressman, that's the way we, st we structure programs in California. We're basically, uh, the utility designs programs, we have about 85 separate programs um, that, that are designed to do exactly what you described, to, to pay down the cost of some of these investments, um, facilitate a faster payback, um, and to get over some first time hurdles. For example, a lot of commercial buildings are built by people who are just going to flip them and not, and not own them, or who won't pay the, uh, the HVAC uh, costs uh, because those are charged to the tenants. So trying to get, as those buildings are built, have, get them built to high standards of energy efficiency means that uh, you know, you're know you gonna have a higher comfort level and you're also gonna have a much cheaper, better building. Do you see any opportunity with uh, LEEDS uh, to create a, a tax incentive for building efficiency? Mr. Dakotas? Yes, we, we have a tax incentive in New York for LEED certified buildings. Um, and it's been very effective. Um, I would like to add also that, that I would concur that I think electric and gas efficiency programs could save on the order of at least a half to one and a half percent per year. I also believe, uh, I believe this is the experience in California and I know it is in New York because we've been offering efficiency programs for near three decades now. There is a industry that's been developed uh, that is poised and ready and waiting uh, to take on uh, a competitive market for energy efficiency, and it's really quite a robust market. Um, it, it's disparate in different states, but I've seen the industry grow from infancy to what it is today, and it is quite a robust market. I hope I, am I imposing on my uh, time, uh, um, Mr. Chairman? I, I wouldn't use the word imposing. Uh, you have exceeded your time, but, uh, but it, the, the brilliance of your questions uh, actually <laughs> would not allow the word imposition to be used. But uh, if you don't mind, perhaps your time could expire right now. Okay. I will ask some I questions yield. and we'll come right back to you again. Okay. Great. Um, uh, th and by the way, the gentleman from California is um, actually uh, uh, founded a renewables company uh, in California. So he's got some uh, background in it as well. Um, let me go to you uh, quickly, uh, Mr. Uh, Sakalaris. Um, you said that we consume in the United States the equivalent of 47 million barrels of oil a day. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. So 21 million barrels of the 47 million is oil. That is correct. Approximately 10 um, million uh, would, be the, would be coal. About 10 million would be natural gas. Is, is that basically in the ballpark? Correct. So that's about 41 million of the 47 million. And then the remainder uh, in equivalents of oil would be nuclear power. It's hydro, others. Hydropower, Correct. Um, uh, solar, whatever, mm -hmm. the, the smaller sources. Is that, is that correct? That is correct. Okay. So as you're breaking down the 47 million, mm -hmm. 
including where it goes in the transportation sector, the building sector, you know, commercial, industrial, mm -hmm. uh, and home. Uh, where do you see the biggest potential gains? That is, out of the 47 million barrels of oil equivalent, which right. one of those categories is where the biggest gains can be reached and which are the smallest? I think the fastest one, it will be the residential sector followed by the industrial sector. Okay. And what can happen in the residential sector? Changing out the light bulbs, so changing out heat and ventilating air conditioning. Well, of the 47 million <laughs> barrels of oil equivalent, how much of that is in the residential sector? It's about uh, 20 percent. So about, uh, you're saying about 11 million, uh, well, no, about, uh, about 10 million. Ab about 10. About 10 million. <coughs> and uh, in, in that sector of 10 million um, in the residential sector, you think that you can reduce it down to 8 million? That is correct. Okay. And, and probably, actually, I think it's a little bit higher. It's somewhere between 20 to 30 percent of the residential sector. I don't know exactly. So two to, th two to three million, you think, could I, be I would say so. The and, but the so, and you said the total reduction would be nine million that could be reached. So let's go to the next sector. What, mm -hmm. in, in the industrial sector, how many millions of barrels? In of the it's over 30 percent, somewhere between 30 to 40 percent. So another two to, three million, two to three million barrels a day. Mm -hmm. How about in the transportation sector? That's one of the soft numbers that uh, we have in uh, our analysis because it's between the aviation. It, you said it's one of the soft numbers? So, soft numbers because how much uh, mileage improvement we can get on uh, per cars and, and so on. Okay, so when, 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 when my amendment was adopted and signed into law by the president. And that's the one, and that's the one by the way, that we use to estimate what potential we thought it will come from that sector. You, your company uses my amendment and its result in your company's we, amendment? We, we use some of the, 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 the goals. Yeah, oh, <laughs> thank you, thank you. So when you, when you factor in that by law now, uh, yeah. the it's fuel economy standards have to go from 25 to 35 miles per gallon. Yeah. What, how many barrels of oil does that save per day? Do, do you? Uh, I don't recall right now the exact number. The answer is two million. Is so okay. Yeah, you can build that in. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> this, and uh, and you're saying and, and the remaining uh, couple of million barrels comes from everything else that we uh, do in society, right? To get it up to nine million. The, the, the rest of it is uh, federal government buildings and uh, and, government buildings. and uh, some of the other institutional uh, yeah. market. I see. Let me let me ask this. Um, here, here we have, we, we bring in all the good students. So you're all sitting down here and, uh, and we're all giving you gold stars today for the excellent work which you're already doing. And we're trying to hold you up as an example to all of the states and all of the utilities, other companies that aren't quite meeting the same standards that you are right now. Huh? And so the first, qu the first question is, well, I think, I guess the most important question is, we really don't have to give you any more incentives. You're like the kids at Brown University. They don't even give exams to. You're just doing it, you know? And so, you know, but a lot of people need exams, you know, just so they do the work, they can study. They buy the textbook like two days before the exam, but at least they have to, they know there's an exam coming up. So there are many states, many utilities that really aren't doing any of this in a significant way. So what do we have to do in order to get other states to adopt uh, the policies that are existing in the states that we see here. What do we have to do about decoupling? What do we have to do about, how, how do we create this dynamic whereby these other states and other utilities uh, adopt the policies in New York and Massachusetts and in uh, California? We'll begin with you, Mr. Cullen. Well, I'd, I'll just re emphasize what I said in, in my opening testimony. I think that, uh, I'll make two points. The first is that carbon legislation, climate change legislation enacted by Congress is going to, uh, has the potential to cause significant price increases that we hope can, we can avoid by better design. That's the first part of the answer. Uh, so no, even. What I'm saying to you is a lot of utility executives already know that, but they're still not doing it. A lot of what state utilities. So what do we I do to them? Just get I down I to the I answer. Yeah, what's, I mean, what's, what I do we have there? We know the problem. What do we have to do? Well. I think we have to create a performance-based allocation of significant fraction of carbon credits that would be available to every state and would be available to states in proportion to the degree to which they meet their own state baseline. So Indiana isn't competing with California. Indiana, in order to earn allowances under a performance-based system, 
has to beat Indiana's past performance. Okay, um, Mr. Sakalaris. Uh, part of that might be uh, uh, the carrot and the stick type of an approach. You know, if we have all this allowance money, uh, how we send it back to the state provided that they, they are doing something in energy efficiency. But if we, tr we need first progressive commissions around the country, like California or New York, they have, and they promote, or the state of Massachusetts, for example, that they promote this uh, uh, energy efficiency projects. And then maybe take it to, down to the level with the utilities where we have incentives in the rate base making and how they, they earn back their, their uh, let's say it's if the allowable rate of return is 8%, if they do energy efficiency projects, they get the 9% incentive rate of return, or if they don't, they get maybe 7%. So if you have some kind of an uh, incentive on the, the rate making. Okay, great. Mr. And Klein. I, I agree with that. I think decoupling is critical, uh, mandated or bribe states to do it, because if if you don't accomplish that, then then fundamentally you're not going to change the mindset of utilities. Um, it's the first step, and then the second step, as as my colleague has just stated, is is to build in incentives and, in a performance based way that will uh, encourage and and uh, create metrics that that will allow you to judge whether it's happening. So here we are. We're in California, New York, Massachusetts. People do it because they say, "Hey, we're going to make money." And then you're using the phrase bribe. I mean, it's in parentheses for anyone who's watching. They don't really mean it. They're, they're, just, they're just talking about what kind of incentives do we have to give to a state to figure out that it's in their interest anyway to move in this direction. So why do we have to do that? Why, what, can you explain that, Mr. Klein, so we can just get your perception of what it is about these other states that don't move in this direction, that we have to figure out a way, quote, unquote, to bribe them to do something that's in their best interest? I, and I apologize for that. Uh, oh, that's okay. Uh, it's fine. Words. I've already explained to the listening public. But you don't mean it. <laughs> but but I think that if Legal. you if you think about a, a mindset of an industry that for over a hundred years has made money by selling more, and all of a sudden you're coming to them and saying, um, "We're going to flip this on its head." And right, but I, well, I know what you're saying, Mr. Klein. But it's not 1968 anymore. It's 2008. You know and why don't these, you know, California started in the 70s, you know, Massachusetts, New York, Minnesota, other states have already moved. What's holding these people back? How, 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 what, is it just the power of these local utilities and they don't want to change at all because they must obviously know that this is working for you? Why don't they move in that direction? I, I, I think honestly because many of them still make a lot more money okay. selling more. But, but couldn't they make just as much money by selling less? Potentially. Potentially. But not in the short term, probably. Okay. Uh, Ms. Grunich. When, let me just quickly what you had just said. Um, I was just at a um, National Governors Association meeting in Kansas City this week talking with a number of utility executives and um, you know, they know if they can still, if it's still legal in the United States or in their state to build a conventional coal plant yep. and they can put it in the rate base, they will make a profit. And there is great uncertainty still. Um, so they know they can get that coal plant in, they can make a profit, they know how to build coal plants. Um, there is still great unfamiliarity with how to run energy efficiency programs on the scale of an equivalent of a power plant. Um, so, when it, so in telecom law, uh, everything just kept going along, uh, never changed, and then we put price caps in, and all of a sudden, huh, we saw a huge change in utilities right, uh, across the country. They realized right. they had to stop modernizing, right? Yeah. So that's the equivalent here. Uh, as well with decoupling. You have, it's, to find, it, you have to find a way here of just changing the mindset legally so that they're forced in the same way price caps uh, did it. And um, so uh, e even a cap and trade system here is kind of the equivalent of, of the, once you set the cap, then all of a sudden new thinking has to occur. And I, and I think the challenge is, is that there isn't going to be one item that Congress can do in terms of here's one line in a bill that's going to get energy efficiency at the level we need to have it if we're going to deal with it. It's going to be 
a series of fairly complex different things to think through. I mean, I, I would say in addition to everything else I've heard, a statement in whether it's another law on energy or in the climate change that literally does say energy efficiency is a num is a number one top priority policy or among them that we're going to pursue. And that, that sort of clear statement. Okay, but my time has expired. Let me turn to back to Mr. McNerney and recognize him again. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I feel like I neglected in my manners to, uh, to thank the panel for coming, especially Mr. Klein from PG&E, which is my home district. So uh, my home, uh, I, I use PG&E power and, and gas. So thank you for coming, all, all the members. And, and the for, com for Commissioner Grunick for, for coming today. Um, one of the things that excites me the most about global warming is the opportunity for us to create uh, jobs and prosperity in our own country if we follow a sensible path. Uh, and Mr. Uh, uh, Ms. Grunick mentioned uh, that in China, I think you're the one that mentioned it, uh, you were there, and they're very excited about energy efficiency. Where do you think we are with regard to technology that we could export to China or other countries of the world, creating jobs here in this country vis-a-vis uh, -vis where they would be uh, to create uh, uh, industries that would take those jobs away from us? Um, Mr. Sokolaris, could you take a stab at that? On the intellect, we have the intellectual capital in order to, to help them substantially. As a matter of fact, our company, we get uh, at least uh, once a month an invitation to uh, either do a partnership with some Chinese company. They are looking for knowledge. I think we can, uh, especially um, with the product where we finance the projects, because that's one of the, the, the products that we have where we finance the particular energy savings project, and then we guarantee that the savings will be there. And uh, they're looking for help to see how we can do those projects. So we could create some jobs in the United States by promoting energy efficiency. Because in uh, China, on a per capita, on a per unit of economic output, they use more than twice the energy that we are using. So the potential for them for energy efficiency is substantially more than us. Yes, Mr. Carroll. Well, just um, to speaking to the jobs question, I think that the, there are an enormous number of jobs to be had by accelerating energy efficiency in the United States. Most of them will be jobs deploying energy efficiency in the United States, uh, as opposed to uh, producing products that we will ship to the rest of the world. The, I, I just didn't want to overlook the fact that there is, this is a very big potential area of job growth economy-wide to, to implement all the measures that my colleagues here have been talking about. Well, what I would hope is that we have technology we can s ship overseas that would help them make their buildings more efficient. Or, uh, or, uh, uh, but especially what I want to avoid is having them do the reverse to us. Right. Uh, of course. So uh, I mean, are there, are, uh, we must have manufacturers that are, are, are technology that is on this edge. We, we, who, we do have technology, but um, uh, implementing energy efficiency in the United States, uh, what we are talking about the numbers earlier. We will create between three to five million jobs per year anyway here, because most of those jobs, over 50 percent, it's labor. It's, uh, you need the electricians, you need uh, mechanical contractors, and so on, besides the engineers and the construction managers and the financiers. So the, the jobs will be created here. Let, let me give you, um, sure. again, I'm going to, we can boast together about California that some of the most exciting innovations in technology on energy efficiency, frankly, are happening in California. I had the opportunity to do a tour of Silicon Valley about six weeks ago, and there's a company that is starting up making, for example, zero net energy cement. They took the brightest of the brains um, and said, here's what we're going to do. Here are the parameters. We want to have a product that has as close to zero net carbon emissions as possible. We want to have a product that performs as well or better in terms of quality. We want to have a product that right out of the box, it's as cheap as what is the existing product on the market, and we want to have it scalable because we know we need to be using it throughout the world. 
they have been able to literally now develop a process that is close to zero net energy production for cement. Uh, another company is working on drywall that you put in the building. So we are really seeing, and, and these are also setting up some factories in, in California to produce the product. So I think it is another example of we can be creating the jobs and we can be creating the industry. and. We in the United States have the opportunity to be the world leaders in doing this. Right. Can I add to that briefly? Sure, Mr. We, we have a green collar workforce uh, training program in New York um, that is fairly well funded in partnership with the colleges and universities in New York to train the next generation of worker in green energy technology and efficiency, is that including uh, renewable energy. Is that focused on community colleges? Yes, it is. Okay. Yes. Um, and it's 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 growing in its recognition and its uh, certification of of employees, and we couple that with a research and development program that New York runs, which is developing and working with industry in New York to to create that technology that they are then trained on, and as the technology is developed and we have workforce training and certification, we then deploy those technologies through our energy efficiency programs with exactly the point in mind that you made, that we need to be the state or we need to be the country that exports the technology. We don't want to be importing it. Mr. Chairman, I have one more question, but I will defer to you at this point. Oh, and, and I am going to, in turn, defer back to you so that you can ask your question. Okay. Um, this one is for Mr. Klein. Uh, I have noticed with PG&E that uh, the company is fairly receptive to ener energy efficiency measures which will reduce the need to put in new power plants. And I think that is basically the business model. If you can avoid putting in new power plants, you are going to make money, uh, you are going to make more money uh, in a sense. So um, how, how effective a message is that to other utilities to get, to get them on board with that? I mean, it seems like ultimately if you give up all, uh, all, all of the, uh, the power um, the energy supply needs that you are going to be a distribution company and a transmission company rather than a, than a, uh, um, a generation company. Is that? Um I think that, that you described the model correctly um, with, with the addition that if, if we can avoid transmission, there is a, a financial benefit to customers uh, there also. Um, I, I think that, that there is a uh, a set of companies in the Edison Institute, um, which is the, the trade organization for, uh, for the electric utility in industry, has, has created uh, a new institute for energy efficiency. So I think there is increasing interest and, and wanting to know more. I think that one of the issues you identified is that um, if companies extrapolate and it means that they never build generation, then they don't want to shrink necessarily. So there needs to be right. a mechanism to assure that, that that doesn't happen. And, and, and part of it may be simply that there's enough um, customer growth and, uh, and distribution smart grid kinds of additions to, to rate base that, uh, that make that not a problem. Is there a, a concern about competitiveness if, if you continue this business model uh, with neighboring utilities that might offer communities an alternative to your business? I think it has been an issue in some cases where, where we uh, compete for customers with irrigation districts, for example, who right. aren't under the same uh, requirements and don't provide the same services. Um, but but on, on the whole, I would say it's not a big problem. Thank you. With that, I uh, yield back. Um, I, I thank the gentleman and the gentleman's uh, time has expired. What I am going to do right now is ask each one of you to give us the one minute, one minute that you want to be on the record for eternity as we look back in history and they come to this hearing and they say, there, it was there in that one minute that, that those five people on their one minute summarized all you needed to know about the future, about energy efficiency, about economic growth, about saving the planet from, uh, from, from catastrophic climate change. Then they, they in their one minute explained how we could do it. And we are going to go in reverse order. And you, Mr. Cowell, will have the first opportunity to give us your one minute on that. All right. 
Well, thanks for the opportunity for th and, and thank you for hosting this hearing. Energy efficiency is the low cost carbon scrubber and it is going to be the essential cornerstone of our nation's climate strategy. It must be. And the Congress has to think about the ways to build energy efficiency attainment into any carbon program, including a cap and trade program that uh, Congress enacts. And that requires thinking creatively about what it takes to motivate the delivery of energy efficiency, uh, which is different from the architecture that we have historically used for carbon cap and trade. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Sakalaris. I will be very specific. 20% savings. Thank you. 20% uh, savings, 3.4 billion barrels of oil savings per year, corresponding 1.2 billion metric tons per year of emission reductions, creation of 3 to 5 million jobs per year, and uh, we need uh, the trade allowances to be auctioned. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Klein. Uh, I, I would start by referring folks to the, uh, the supply curve that the McKinsey Global Institute put together for greenhouse gas abatement in the U.S. I, I think it's, it's very instructive about what we can do today, what we can do at, in many cases, negative cost. Um, to the extent that the federal government can start by putting building standards in place, minimum standards that states can rise above, um, I think that would be a, an amazing start because we continue to be, to be building buildings that uh, for the life of the, of the facility are, are going to be drags on our efficiency and are much more expensive to retrofit. Uh, Ms. Gernick. Two things. First, the two to one rule. For every dollar you invest in energy efficiency, you're saving two dollars. You accelerate that up in a, uh, California, our billion dollars a year in energy efficiency, that's ten billion dollars. Over ten years, we're saving ten billion dollars. That's going into California's economy. It is not going overseas at all. It's growing our economy. That's the message I think that wins. Beautiful. Secondly, please act. We need buildings are going up, appliances are being bought, and that just makes it more difficult to go back and fix things. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Dakotas. Yes, thank you. And, and I would echo that uh, in terms of taking action. I think if anything came out of this session today, um, it is that there is a, a, a need for leadership at the federal level to bring the states together uh, toward clean energy policy. And I think it's important to create what we call in New York an energy efficiency ethic. So when people make decisions, purchase decisions, uh, we could change the way they think, we could change the way they live, we could change the way they work, and we could change the way they play while working within private markets to create a profit potential for clean energy technology. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Dakotas, very much. And, uh, and we thank all of you for your testimony. Absolutely um, fascinating. And, uh, and central. It, this is the most exciting, least glamorous hearing that is going to be conducted uh, in the Congress this year. Uh, but like many other non-glamorous um, uh, uh, subjects, he, the, herein lies the truth uh, uh, that uh, will create the path uh, to uh, saving the planet and reducing dramatically the amount of energy. And again, we turn to California for the formula. You know, back in 1962, the Beach Boys and Surf City, they, they had a two-for-one formula to do, at, which is at Surf City, there were two girls for every boy. And that was a, and that for, that for someone in a blue-collar town in Malden, Massachusetts, that was a dream in California. <laughs> that almost seemed too good to be true. And it turns out it was too good to be true. It never did exist there or any place else. However, here, the new two-for-one rule coming out of California and Massachusetts uh, and out of New York, for every dollar you invest in energy efficiency, you get back two additional dollars. Kind of a miracle, huh? No, not a miracle. Just what my mother used to say. My mother used to say, Eddie, always try to work smarter, not harder. She would say that immediately, immediately before she said, Eddie, I'm donating your brain to Harvard Medical School as a completely unused human organ. Uh, and that was because, you know, I wasn't thinking smarter. Now, we have many utilities and many uh, 
uh, states whose brains collectively should be donated to Harvard Medical School, because this is obviously the way to go. Uh, it, it's proven. It's a moneymaker. Uh, and yet people still resist it. Why? Because it's not the way they've done business in the past. And so this is a tremendous um, opportunity for us. We saw in the telecommunications revolution that we could go from the 1996 Telecommunications Act, where not one single home had broadband, not one home in America, 1996. But once we got that policy right on a national level, we moved to a point where now, 11 years later, 12 years later, Broadband is almost ubiquitous in its deployment. Companies like Amazon, Google, YouTube didn't even exist three years ago, but only possible because we got the policy right, revolutionizing uh, these issues. And so that same kind of technological uh, revolution is possible here in the energy sector as well. It's all there. As Mr. Klein said, the technologies are already there. They're ready to go. But we need the will and the political policies put in place so that we unleash this revolution in a way that isn't just isolated to individual utilities, individual states, but the, that the United States is the leader, looking over its shoulder at number two and three and four in the world as we export these products, export these ideas all around the planet. And so that's what this hearing really represents to me, because in a lot of ways, efficiency is the whole key to solving the problem of global warming to reducing our energy dependence and, and this is hard to believe, creating the new major economic uh, driver in our whole society, the job creator, the way in which we kind of revolutionize the way in which we look at these issues. Now, it was hard for the telephone companies to change. You know, AT&T had 1.2 million employees. We all still had our black rotary dial phone. Why would you want to change? It's working out great. Each one of you is renting for $3 a month, every single month for your whole life, a black rotary dial phone. That's a good business. And the utilities you know, loved it. And the regulators let them get away with it. My mother paid $1,200 for that, renting it for 40 years, a black rotary dial phone. But no innovation, no new phones, no new devices, no Google, no Amazon, no YouTube. You know, but yet you could always dial that, that phone, huh? Well, that's what we're still doing in energy, huh? That's what we're still doing. We're still relying upon old ways of generating electricity. And so who would have thought that in the old days, when you got on the phone and somebody called from another state, you know, your grandmother was calling in, did hand around the phone saying, you got to talk fast, it's long distance. Because it was going to be so expensive, huh? And AT&T made so much money on the long distance call. Now you talk long distance like you're talking across the street, because through new technology and new ways of looking at the issue, we lowered the price dramatically. All that happened in one technological generation. Huh? We're going to be able to do the same thing here in energy efficiency. And it is going to become the new source, the major engine for economic growth in the United States in the next generation. Millions of jobs economic growth, export opportunities for us. Your insights are valuable. We need to get you more allies in this fight. But uh, I think ultimately the truth of your testimony will set the Congress free, and, and we will be able uh, to pass the legislation uh, before Copenhagen in December of 2009 uh, that will make it possible for us to see this revolution in all of its full flower. We thank you for the leadership you have shown. This hearing is adjourned. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you.